Welcome to the Oral Apothecary Podcast, authentic chat about medicines, pharmacy and healthcare in the UK. Pharmacists Jamie, Gimmo and STC take on topical and controversial stories, but keep it edgy yet light-hearted. Podcasts share their desert island drugs, a career anthem and joyful patient stories. Welcome, this is the Oral Apothecary Podcast. My name is Jamie Hayes. Coming up in this week's episode, we're joined by Professor Rachel Elliott. Rachel is a pharmacist and professor of health economics at the University of Manchester. We'll hear from Rachel in a moment as she shares her Desert Island Drug, a career anthem, and recommends a book for the Oral Apothecary Library. It's the same every week, just different. Our micro-discussion will look at the topic of potentially inappropriate prescribing and its impact on patients in hospital and secondary care. But first, let me welcome my two fellow apothecaries. STC is in Bournemouth and Gimmo is in Cardiff. Welcome both. Evening. Evening. What have you been up to? I've been on holiday. It's half term, so I've been away for a couple of days and went to a place called Lake Barla or Llyn Tegid, Tegid, I think it's pronounced in Welsh. Is that right, Jamie? He won't know. <laughs> Fantastic place to recommend it. It's a huge lake in the middle of North Wales. And you like your outdoor swimming, don't you, Steve? So good for swim, good for paddleboarding. I actually think I prefer beaches on a lake because there's no sand. So it was it was good. And then been in the vaccination clinic this afternoon and that was great because when I went out to see what was going on, everyone well they looked about twelve, but I'm assuming they were eighteen. So starting to get the young uns through in Cardiff, which is fantastic. I've also been on holiday this week, but I'm training for a very long ride in the Dartmoor Classic in a couple of weeks' time, so I'll be doing a lot of cycling. You'll be pleased to know that if I'm cycling it means I'm listening to podcasts. I had a bit of a hit. I decided I should listen to my menopause doctor, which is the number one in the app. Apple medical podcast, something that we keep our eye on, obviously. What number are we? We did get to number eight last week, but the clear leader ever since we started is Dr. Louise Newham, my menopause doctor. So after Gimmo mentioned about HRT a couple of weeks ago, I wanted to listen to the one with Davina McCall and good it was too. So I just put it out there on Twitter and said, hey, fellow podcaster, <laughs> fellow health podcaster, would you like to come on the oral apothecary? And she said, yes. So that's great. So that'll probably be season, season, series three. And I also listened to a great podcast by Stephen Levitt who's the other Stephen from Freakonomics from people I mostly admire and it's a guy called Professor Carl Hart who is a neuroscientist from Columbia University and the whole podcast is about his view about legalizing all drugs and he's openly talks about his use of you know hard illicit drugs himself but he talks about legalizing drugs which is a really good podcast if you're interested in that. I've got a couple of things um, I was out with some of my park run chums last weekend and they quite rightly reminded me that the oral apothecary is not just for healthcare professionals and so they pointed out it's for the public patients and our friends and family too so we've been asked to watch our jargon monoxide levels (laughs) (laughs) i love that term yeah so that's from bob sutton good boss bad boss our jargon monoxide levels Okay, before I hand over to SDC to welcome this week's guest, I've got a joyful patient story for you. And it's from Shaheen Shora and Danielle Adams. I think Shaheen is a consultant psychiatrist and Danielle is a pharmacist in Hertfordshire. It was published a couple of years ago. And it's one of these letters that I've read out at conferences, just like a squash and a squeeze that we did a few weeks ago. And now that we've got a podcast, I can share it with you too. They report a case of an 87-year-old woman with vascular dementia admitted to an older adult psychiatry inpatient unit. In the three months prior to admission, she'd been prescribed and was now taking promethazine, nitrazepam, trazodone, amacelpride, plus lorazepam when required. The unit staff were informed by a family that she'd been a very active person, enjoying painting and music, and had been a talented piano player. On admission, she presented as having the appearance of being heavily sedated and difficult to arouse. She was unable to swallow, keeping her food in her mouth, and was drooling saliva. Her medication was being administered in liquid form. She was sitting slumped in a chair and was hardly able to participate in any meaningful conversation and she was unable to walk independently. Her medication was reviewed with deep prescribing of psychotropic medication identified as the priority. All the psychotropic medicines except trazodone were discontinued with reduction of medicines taking place over four to eight weeks in a staggered manner. The patient became more alert, able to interact with staff and her mobility improved so she was able to walk independently. The consultant, psychiatrist and nursing staff started to take her to the piano, letting her touch the keyboard on a daily basis. The patient slowly started to play the piano on the ward with one hand first. Within a few weeks, much to the delight of her son and daughter, she began to play beautiful pieces from memory. So that's one of those 
squashing and squeezes that I've read that letter out at conferences and workshops over the years. It was published in the European Journal of Hospital Pharmacy a couple of years ago, that's Steve's journal, and it always, for me, brings the, the human element to the word deprescribing. I recognise those sorts of things. And that was a themed issue, actually, on polypharmacy, wasn't it, with Nina Barnett? OK, well, I'd like to welcome to the Oral Apothecary Professor Rachel Elliott. As Jamie said, she's the Professor of Health Economics and Deputy Director of the Manchester Centre for Health Economics at the University of Manchester, which is not actually a pharmacy school professorship. But I first met Rachel in 2003, I think it was, in Copeland 3 building when I first started working at the university. Rachel was already there and came from a background of an industrial pharmacist with Merrill Dow and then she was a hospital pharmacist. In fact she was the first full-time ICU pharmacist in the UK from 1992 to 95 at Charing Cross Hospital. She then did a PhD in health economics. From that she really took into health economics and became one of the academic leads for the data lab at the University of Manchester Health Innovation and she's worked a lot with NICE and works with a lot of technology innovation and evaluation as a health economist working with the Department of Health NHS and NICE and all sorts of things and using all sorts of weird and wonderful study designs that I can't even spell let alone explain so it's an absolute pleasure to invite you onto the oral apothecary Rachel. Hello thank you very much for inviting me to be on your podcast which I've had enjoyed listening to um, the previous episodes and I'm um, looking forward to um, having some interesting conversations with the three of you and it's nice to see you again Steve and to see that you are still the sparkling interesting and slightly scarily clever person that I remember from Manchester although you appear to have a little bit less hair I'm not sure how <laughs> to say that yeah no you can absolutely so what is on your agenda at the minute then as a health economist because I know it's not within the pharmacy school but obviously it's a lot about medicines but not just medicines so what is on number one on your agenda at the minute you want to talk to us about? So it's interesting because um, when I started health economics back in the 1990s you know before the flood it was an interesting career choice to take and ever since then I felt like a two-headed monster so I feel a little bit like I'm not a very good pharmacist now and not a very good health economist but actually I think at the moment, the, the two things that I think are important that have become key research areas for me have been around medicines, because medicines has always been the thing that I've found fascinating. So medicines adherence by patients has always been a key thing for me, and medicine safety. And I think, although we don't want to sort of harp on about the, the C word too much, COVID has been an interesting time for medicines safety and medicines adherence and as somebody that works in technology development and assessment I've seen the explosion of digital technology which has been great in some ways but not in others and I do worry about what much more intelligent commentators than me have termed um, technology solutionism you know where there's an app to solve everything even if the problem doesn't exist and I'm actually in the middle of listening to the audiobook version of um, To Save Everything Click Here by Evgeny Muratsov but but to bring that back down to sort of, um, you know, what, what is relevant to me, it, when you work in health economics, people think you're not interested in the patient, but actually you really are interested in the patient because every time you spend money on one patient in a system, you don't spend that money on somebody else. And you have to make sure that the money you're spending is getting more benefit for the patient in front of you than the person you're not spending it on. I feel that COVID has been an interesting time for the explosion of digital and remote technology and in some respects that's been really useful but what it also has done is expose some gaps in services and also not everybody that works in healthcare and not everybody that uses healthcare understands digital technologies and also some of those digital technologies are not fit for purpose. Some of them are excellent, some of them aren't and it takes a lot of effort, expertise and talking to lots of different people to work out where digital technology can really help people and which people it can help and use it in the right way but not assume that it's going to solve everything yeah matt hancock likes his digital technology doesn't he but it might be leveled at him that he perhaps doesn't understand what you're describing that you need to use it intelligently we have to prove that it works that people can interact with it and use it and that it's better than what we've got that's right and you know let's just look at the medicines use process in a simple way and look at how covid has affected that and how digital technologies are assumed to have helped but actually does it really work so you've got a 
patient who's socially isolating or has been and so they don't want to go to the GP and everybody says well that's fine you can have a video consultation or a telephone consultation the, da the data suggests that there are no virtually no video consultations they're all telephone consultations which is very convenient for everybody except you know if somebody rings you up in the middle of when you're I don't know feeding your child or in the middle of a meeting and then you're expected to talk about why you need your antidepressant or your anti-epileptic it's not ideal and also um, one of the GPs that I work with said well you can't see that somebody's unwashed and haven't cleaned their teeth for three days on the telephone but it's very convenient because you can talk to them without having to go in and so then you say well actually yeah I do need a repeat of my prescription and you don't even have to go to the GP to pick up your prescription it's incredibly convenient we'll get it's sent to the pharmacy for you. Obviously, EPS is great. I was involved in that evaluation. There's some jargon um, monoxide there, I think, EPS. Sorry, jargon monoxide. Electronic which I have, prescription. Electronic prescription service. So the, the GP sends the prescription to your designated pharmacy. And you think, well... I don't want to go to the pharmacy because there are queues out there and I, I don't really want to queue. A, I can't queue because maybe I've got arthritis, I can't stand for that long and also I'm worried about social distancing. And so they say, well, that's fine, we can deliver it home um, and they say and you say well that's fantastic thanks very much from the phone call to the GP to your prescription arriving on your front doorstep it's all terribly convenient what you probably really needed maybe was to have a conversation with the GP about why your medicines are or aren't working and also maybe have a conversation with the pharmacist about why your medicines are or aren't working so there are two situations there where the safety net of people being non-adherent or having concerns about their medicines or not having the right medicine or demonstrating adverse effects have been missed and that's what worries me is that some people are obsessed with convenience that actually it's taking away from the actual uh, complexity of the process of prescribing and dispensing and using medicine. Oh, that's fantastic and I think that's such a really good breakdown of where we are at the moment is in a situation where and that phrase techno te was it technological social solutionism yeah yeah you know video consultations telephone consultations telephone triage you know I've experienced it firsthand where you know one of my own members of my family and one of my children and we we needed to talk to a doctor and you know you have to ring at the certain time and then you have to wait for the, I think your point about waiting for the call um, and then when you get the call it's not really very satisfactory because as a parent you really wanted the reassurance of seeing someone and the response I got back was well don't you know that it's COVID and I thought well I do but at the same time that hasn't left me feeling very satisfied and I work in improvement and the amount of times I've heard we look at a problem and then they say we're going to develop an app I've heard that said many many times it's an easy way to think of a solution without actually getting into the complexity of it isn't it you know, there are lots of situations where digital technology can really help. And I'm not a Luddite in any respect at all. And I love my iPhone. I have an emotional connection to my iPhone. You could have your own podcast, Rachel, from all the work that's on your website, on your <laughs> on your University of Manchester, your publications. As you look at that, you could have a, a whole podcast. You could have a whole <laughs> podcast series there, Rachel, because there's a diverse group of topics that you're looking at there. And the one thing I wanted to ask you about was the narrative experiences online work. Are you able to share more about that? Oh, this is just such a fascinating piece of work. So it's an interesting journey. I'll be very quick. I, you know, I started as an intensive care pharmacist. I wasn't interested in a patient because that meant if they were awake, they could talk, so they weren't anaesthetised. And as I've become a health economist, as well as a pharmacist, I've realised that a lot of money gets spent on high priority areas, high profile areas. And actually, the areas where there's the most unmet need are areas such as mental health. But when we're at NICE, we spend a lot of time dancing on the head of a pin, talking about about cancer treatments and actually you know out there there are hundreds of thousands of people with mental health problems and hearing disability and my research is around those groups of people that are the unheard majority. So NEON is a big program grant funded by the NIHR and this is around using online narratives to help people to deal with their mental health condition and the theory is based on the idea that if you listen to other people talking about how they have dealt with their condition it helps you to deal with your condition as well so somebody with very severe OCD might talk about how they felt when they were feeling at their worst 
and then what they did to make them feel a bit better, what helped them and how they feel now. And listening to that narrative can help somebody else to deal with that. Now, the narratives come in a range of formats. There, Some of them are videos, some of them are audio tapes, some of them are just written stories. So we have a huge library of these narratives and people, they self-diagnose um, for this intervention. This is not via a mental health professional or a GP. We also have people just self-diagnosing. So people coming in and saying, you know, I think I've got something that I want help with. And then they go in and they go through a range of questions. And we have some artificial intelligence based algorithms.